Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Planetary Society's Weekly Hangout. I'm Emily Lakdawalla. I am the senior editor and blogger for the Planetary Society. You can find me writing about uh, current space research and exploration every day at planetary.org. Um, I am joined today by a couple of people from the Planetary Society and by special guest Amy Meinzer from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to talk about her work on the WISE mission, studying asteroids and other things that move in and beyond our solar system. Hi, Amy. Hello. Hey. <clears throat> Thanks so much for joining us. Um, but first, before we get started, I would like to hand the show over to Casey Dreyer to give us a little bit of an update on what's going on right now with making sure that there will be more space exploration in the future. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so, uh, we had some great news uh, earlier this week, or last week, I should say. Uh, this is not something I'm used to saying, or even good news, or even positive news. So let me just give a quick background for everybody who's just joining in on this issue. Uh, last year, the President of the United States released a proposed budget for 2013. In that budget uh, was a cut of 20% to the part of NASA that sends robotic missions to the planets. Curiosity, Voyager, Cassini, Messenger, these are all funded out of this one part of NASA. And it, hit, it lost about a fifth of its funding proposed. So that's bad. Uh, we are not able to keep going to Mars, we're not uh, able to go to the outer planets, we're not able to kind of really keep the robust, balanced system of exploration that we've had. So the Planetary Society has been working very hard lately to try and keep funding for planetary science and to restore funding to planetary science. We've been running a year-long campaign and we're just starting to see some fruits of this. So what happened is the Senate last uh, earlier this week released a proposed budget for, planet uh, for all of NASA and the rest of the government, and it included $200 million going back to planetary science. This is the first time, this is the closest we've come to actually seeing money restored back to this program. Planetary science has been living under this cut since last October. If the Senate passes this bill, We'll see a bunch of money go back to the Mars program, we'll see a bunch of money go back to outer planets, and we'll see money starting to go to a Europa mission planning process. So it's getting a start. I, I like to think of it as keeping the embers warm on a Europa mission to explore Jupiter's icy moon and its ocean. So this was fantastic news. Caveats include that the, the Senate has to pass this bill, which is no easy task these days uh, in Congress. So we're following this very closely. It's likely to be resolved in some way or another in the next couple of weeks. So we will keep you posted on this. We're just very excited to see the positive news. This is the result of lots of work from you. If you've been sending petitions to Congress, if you've been calling Congress, this is from a lot of work on our part about reaching out to Congress people and very strong supporters of planetary science in Congress to put this money back and make sure that NASA can keep exploring the solar system. I should mention also at this point we have this entirely other issue of sequestration. These across the board cuts to a lot of government programs. NASA's really starting to feel some of the pain to, this, uh, to their program. They just released these directives on uh, travel funding and uh, training to its employees and contractors where they essentially forbid almost all conference travel, all the foreign travel, and uh, this is a really bad thing for scientists because scientists go to these conferences to talk to each other, to share ideas, to work ideas out. And even though a lot of conferences have just presentations, a lot of the really important stuff happens after the presentations when people talk and ideas mingle. So what's happened is that NASA ha now has these incredibly strict restrictions on going to uh, their employees going to a conference. It's almost, it's very, very difficult unless they're very involved. It's very unlikely they're able to go. And this is a real blow to the development of science. So sequestration is still a major problem. We're just starting to see the real effects of that in government agencies like NASA. We're going to be following this too. It's an entirely separate issue from most of our planetary science work. So we will keep you posted on this. You can go to planetary.org slash SOS to hear all about the work that we're doing. Write a letter to Congress, learn how to talk to Congress, stay informed and be a real advocate for this issue. So Emily, I will leave it at that and have a good rest of the show. All right, thanks very much, Casey. And uh, welcome to all of the viewers who have come on while he's talking. There's now more than 100 of you so far, which is excellent. I want to tell all of you who have joined us that you will get a chance to ask Amy questions um, throughout the show, more toward the end of the show. You can ask those questions in several ways. You can post the questions on YouTube. You can post the questions on my blog entry. You can post the questions via Twitter using the hashtag PlanetaryLive. 
Um, and I will uh, be reading those questions later on in the broadcast, and I'll relay some of them to Amy. So um, that's uh, uh, enough of the introductions, Amy. Uh, welcome again. Thanks for joining us. Oh, um, and I'm. It, I think that the Wise mission is cool because it's it's a mission that is really living well beyond the spacecraft mission itself. The spacecraft is actually out there hibernating right now, right? Have you talked to it recently? We actually did talk to it. Yeah, you're right. Wise is in hibernation. It's it's been a very good little spacecraft, and uh, we did ping it a couple months ago, and it's it's still fine. It's still sleeping away. Uh, nothing new in right now, but the the point here is that you know absolutely the mission is still just really getting started, in the sense that right now astronomers are now really starting to dig into the data and and make sense of it, and that's what Wise was really supposed to be about. It was a massive da data gathering exercise. Astronomy, in a lot of ways, people think about, you know, an astronomer goes to the telescope and points the telescope at something and takes some observations and then goes home and reduces the data and publishes the paper. This is an entirely new way, in a sense, uh, in the last you know few decades that astronomy has really started to be done with the gathering of all these massive surveys. So now we have you know, many terabytes of data sitting around, and the trick now is instead of going and, and pointing your telescope at something, it's looking through these huge catalogs that are out there and really picking out the, the gems in this giant pile of data. It's, it's truly the needle in the haystack problem. So, so it, it really is a new way of doing astronomy. So what does the WISE data set actually look like? Is it, uh, when you're working with it, are you working with images or are you working with some other kind of construct that's been built out of the data? Right, so we actually work with both things. Uh, we work with both the, the images themselves and then we also work with what is extracted out of the images. So we have, a, we have a lot of software that goes in and that scrubs through the images and finds every single bright source in there and even the really faint sources. And then it records their brightness, their position, and a whole bunch of information about each and every single source in each frame. And I was just looking at this yesterday. Uh, the WISE catalog has something like in the All Sky Survey, where we take all of the images and combine them all together to make a big map of the whole sky. It's about half a billion sources. That's a lot of <laughs> stuff. And so when you're looking for really rare objects, uh, like the closest star to the sun or, you know, or nearby asteroids, You've got a lot of work to do to pick through all of those sources uh, to find the ones that are the most interesting. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. <laughs> so I've put up here on the screen um, a, a diagram. It's been really fun, actually, over the course of the WISE, Wise mission to watch this diagram get denser and denser. Um, and so, and, and it's sort of a summary of what you've seen in terms of the, the things in the inner part of our solar system. I'm wondering if you can talk us through what we're seeing here, what do all the different colored dots mean? Sure, yeah. This was, uh, the WISE survey was most certainly a, a very wild ride. Uh, it was a really short mission. It was one year, and it just it took off with a bang, and, it, and it, it just stampeded all the way through that year. It was, uh, it was a crazy year. It was, it was amazingly fun, very challenging. What you're seeing here is a bird's eye view of the solar system according to WISE, and the asteroid, specifically the asteroid hunting portion of the mission, which we call NEO-WISE for Near Earth Object Plus WISE, we weren't terribly creative with the acronyms, but uh, what you're seeing is, is what the spacecraft saw when we looked out into the solar system over the course of that one year of surveying. Every single black dot on there is an asteroid that was detected by the NEOWISE uh, project that was actually mined out of the WISE data. The, the outermost orbit that you see on that diagram is Jupiter right there. I'll yeah. leave it as, that, a, as a challenge to the viewers. Can you figure out where the main belt of asteroids is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 20 questions there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically that's, that's what we saw. So we saw about uh, every black dot in there is, is an asteroid. Most of them, like Emily said, are, are in the main belt between Mars and Jupiter. And in total, we observed about 158,000 asteroids uh, with, the, with the survey, with the NEOWISE project, going in and mining these asteroids out uh, from the images on a daily basis. So you can see Jupiter over there on the, on the kind of upper or middle right-hand side of the plot. Yeah, there it is. And you'll notice that there are a couple of blobs of asteroids that are, that are sort of around Jupiter on either side and symmetrically spaced. And those are actually uh, gravitationally stuck to Jupiter. Those are asteroids that are called the Trojan asteroids. They're actually, you know, they follow Jupiter around in its orbit. So that's one clump of objects that we saw. We also saw, you know, many, many objects in the main belt. And that's what that, that big black blob is there surrounding everything. And the reds and the greens, those are near-Earth objects. So these are the portion of the asteroids that get particularly close to the Earth's orbit. Now it doesn't the mean Earth's that... orbit right here. 
Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And the green ones are, are other people's discoveries. The red ones are, are the Neowise discoveries. So uh, you can see we, we saw you know, quite a number of them, not nearly as many as the main belt, though. In total, we had uh, observed about 700 or so near-Earth objects so far with, uh, that we found in the, in the NeoWise data. So it's quite a few. The, um, yeah, and then you can, if you look closely, you can pick out some yellow and blue squares in there. And those are comets that we huh. saw with NeoWise. Yeah, and in total, we have uh, found about 150 or so comets uh, lurking in the, in the WISE data. So that's, that's quite a sample, too. And can you explain so to the viewers? Uh, can you explain to the viewers what this sector is here? It's not actually a gap in the main belt, I don't think. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, the main belt does not have a mysterious missing chunk. Uh, that is unfortunately where all good things came to a mostly end, and that is where Wise ran out of gas, so to speak. Uh, the mission uh, it was using four infrared channels spanning three to about 22 microns. And the shortest of those two wavelengths, the three and the four micron channels, those could operate uh, at fairly warm temperatures, warm for an astronomer. Um, but the two longer wavelengths, the 12 and the 22, those had to be very cold. Those had to be kept at about 8 degrees Kelvin, 8 degrees above absolute zero. And the only way to do that for us was to carry a tank of solid frozen hydrogen that kept oh, the cool. detectors... Yeah, it was pretty nasty stuff, actually, <laughs> but, it, uh, but it worked. The thing is, is that after about, uh, by about August, we started the survey in, uh, in January, and by August, uh, the hydrogen had depleted. That was actually a little more than we were expecting to get out of it. We were hoping for six months. That was the requirement, and so we, we made it past the six-month mark, but, but uh, eventually we ran out of the cryogen, and when that happened, we lost the ability to use those 12 and 22 micron channels. Those are the wavelengths that are, are, were the most sensitive to the asteroids, um, because asteroids are cool compared to stars, and they tend to emit very brightly at 12 and 22 microns. So, um, can you explain, you know, this, this mission, mission can't just be about stamp collecting. I mean, we're not just talking about trying to count all the asteroids. That's not the point. Can you explain what it is that you're trying to get out of this new catalog that you've got? Right, that's the most important thing is, you know, just counting asteroids, no, that's not terribly interesting. And, and what we really like to do with, with the WISE data right now is we're trying to attack some of the larger planetary science questions, such as, you know, some very basic things, you know, where do the asteroids come from? How do they get from the main belt to the Earth objects? What's the deal with those Trojan asteroids that are stuck to Jupiter? How did they get there? How could the formation of the solar system and the giant planets themselves have affected the formation of these Trojan asteroids, and vice versa. I mean, is there something that we can learn from looking at those particular clumps of asteroids that will tell us something about how the giant planets got there? Then the other question, of course, is you know, when it comes to asteroids, most people want to know something about the hazard, the, the impact frequency. Uh, how many, what sizes, what are the orbits like, how often do they impact the Earth? And so those are some of the kinds of questions we've been working on with the data so far. I'm smiling. I'm smiling because, of course, Earth impact hazards have been in the news quite a lot recently. And uh, as an asteroid scientist, you must think that's both awesome and terrifying. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. Yes. I mean, um, wow. What a crazy last few weeks it's been for asteroid science. I mean, I think it's safe to say that the meteor impact. Not only was it a huge surprise that it would happen, but the size of the object that created that level of impact was also a surprise, I think, to scientists, it's safe to say, because canonical wisdom would have held that an object that's about sort of 17, 18 meters across would not really cause much in the way of ground damage, and obviously we've been proven wrong. So uh, there'll be a lot of interesting physics coming out of studying exactly how, how that worked now and why. Given this, um, this swarm of asteroids that, that WISE has detected, I don't, an object of that size is actually not included in your survey, is that right? That's right. So the smallest object that we detected with WISE was about 45 meters, so maybe exactly about double the size of the object. So we, we tended to be sensitive to the larger objects, which from the hazard perspective, those were the ones we were kind of most worried about. Uh, I would say that the, kind of the first question everybody had is, well, could there be another dinosaur impact? Right. right. And so most of NASA's energy up until fairly recently, I would say, has, has really focused on trying to discover and identify that population of, of really large asteroids. And I've got a graphic for that that maybe you could talk us through a little bit. Yeah, that's right. So, so that was one of the first things that we, we looked at with our NEOWISE data was basically, uh, could we say something about how well the surveys are doing to find these very largest asteroids? And I think it's in 1998 that Congress actually chartered NASA with going out and trying to 
discover 90% of all the one kilometer and larger near-Earth objects. So the idea was to see, could there be another uh, extinction level event out there that we don't know about? And astronomers all over the world have, have really been pitching in for the last, uh, since 1998, uh, to, to, to answer that question. But there was always sort of this uncertainty, well, are we done yet? Are we done yet? We, you know, the rate of discovery of large objects has, has really fallen off precipitously over the last few years, but it was really hard to kind of define where the finish line was and whether we had crossed it. So one of the things we did with the NEOWISE sample of, of near-Earth objects that we observed is we went and we looked to evaluate whether or not we had actually achieved that 90% discovery rate for all the one kilometer and larger NEOs. And according to our measurements using infrared light, which is equally sensitive to bright asteroids, highly reflected ones, and very dark ones, uh, we think that, yes, indeed, we have now found more than 90% of all the one kilometer objects. And that's what's on the chart there. So if you look up at the top, the, the good news in terms of the asteroid surveys is that at the one kilometer level, more than 90% of those objects have been discovered to date. And we have reasonable orbits for most of them. Uh, now, there's still you know, more out there that we have to find, a few percent but the vast majority of them have been identified and there is no, nothing on a apparent collision course. So that's great. That's really good. And astronomers all over the world, professionals and amateurs alike, have really tackled this problem. Now, and the smaller sized objects, that's where the story gets a bit more complicated. So if you look down at these sort of 500 to a kilometer level, 500 meters to one kilometers, we found a couple things here. On this plot, what we show is that we were actually relatively surprised to see that in our sample, uh, there are somewhat fewer objects. There are not as many as the original prediction uh, held that there would be. So we found that there are about uh, 20,500 objects that we think are larger, uh, that are out there that are larger than 100 meters in diameter. The previous prediction was somewhere around 36,000, give or take. So just to explain this graphic, the, the whole size of this bar here is how many you guys thought there were there before NeoEyes. And now only the colored in ones, uh, the, both the orangey ones and the green ones here, are the ones is the number representing how many you believe now after NeoWise. That's exactly right. And the filled in ones are the percentage of the ones that have already been discovered. That's what that indicates. So what that says to us is that at the sort of half, half a kilometer to one kilometer size range, a lot of them have been found, uh, which is also very good. But when you get down to the sort of 100 meter level down here, now you can see, it's true, there are fewer overall. There are less green ones now than there were blue ones. About half as many, it looks like. That's right, yeah. That's, it's 20,500 versus about 36,000. But a very small fraction of those have actually been discovered to date, and that's the filled-in ones right there. And then when you get down to the smaller sizes still, there's a lot more uncertainty about the numbers. Uh, our neowide sample didn't cover stuff that small because we just didn't see enough objects to really say for sure. Um, but now, given the fact that um, that the, the survey has showed that there seem to be less medium-sized ones, even fewer smaller-sized ones, then would you as assume that there would be even fewer of those under 100-meter-sized sized, meter sized ones that, than uh, you had originally thought? Not necessarily. So okay. there's a strange thing that's in the, in the older data that people have looked at uh, be, that you know, predates the NEOWISE survey. There's actually a break in the distribution, it looks like, and from the combination of the ball-eyed data, so this is the fireball stuff where people are looking for things that are fireballs, they're using a different set of techniques than, than traditional telescopes. Uh, so if you combine that plus the telescopic data they have from the ground-based surveys, it indicates that the population starts to rise rapidly again. Larger sizes, but there is an indication that there's a break. And unfortunately, we just don't have the data from NEOIS to confirm whether or not this is, is right. Uh, so it's quite possible there are a lot more at smaller size. Now what allowed, uh, I'll throw in a question, what allowed uh, NEOIS uh, to make these different predictions of the populations? What was the difference from the previous uh, observations? Right. So there's several key differences with the, with the spacecraft. And, and thanks for pointing that out, Bruce. And it, it is sort of important. So being a space-based survey uh, conveys several advantages, along with being an infrared survey instead of a visible light survey. In space, there's no weather. Uh, that's a big deal. So there, we don't have to worry about clouds. We don't have to worry about you know, wobbly air, uh, stars twinkling. We don't have to worry about that in space. 
the instrument that we're using is always the same. It's doing the same thing over and over and over again for an entire year, just every 11 seconds taking a picture with the same camera. So there's no worry about using a different instrument or a different telescope or any of that. And when you're trying to do a big survey to compare populations, especially like with the near-Earth objects or the Jovian Trojans, that uniformity is extremely important. And that's, that's always been very difficult to, to disentangle from some of the ground-based surveys which have to deal with weather and so forth. So that's one thing. The other thing which is just as important is that it's the wavelength of the survey. By using these mid-infrared wavelengths, wavelengths that are about sort of 5 to 20 times longer than the visible light that we see with our eyes, we are now, instead of sensing sunlight that's bouncing off the surface of the asteroids, we're actually seeing the heat that they emit. So in other words, sunlight shines on it, the body absorbs the heat, the energy, and it re-radiates it. Well, that, that energy coming off of the asteroid is infrared light. And so because WISE can sense that, it's very good at doing a couple of things. If an asteroid is particularly dark, like a piece of coal, and we know that quite a few of them are, uh, visible light surveys have a harder time discovering those objects mm -hmm. because they're intrinsically less bright. They don't reflect sunlight as well. But they are still warm, and they emit lots of heat, <laughs> right. and we can see them with wise. So that's one thing. We can see the, the darker objects that are hard to get from the ground. The other thing is we can also tell the sizes of the objects very accurately with infrared compared to visible light. With a visible light telescope, you're always going to have this uncertainty. Is in, when you see something and it appears a certain brightness in visible light, you don't really know, is it because it's small but very reflective, mm -hmm. like, a, like a newly paved sidewalk, you know, a piece of sidewalk, or is it large but really, really dark, like the piece of coal. And to the visible light telescope, those two cases look the same. But to an infrared telescope, which is sensing the heat coming off of the surface of the body, it doesn't really matter whether it's highly reflective or highly absorptive. It, it doesn't really matter. It's going to just be the size that determines the, the brightness in the infrared. But won't you get a different equilibrium temperature if you've got a bright object compared to a dark object? Very slightly. It turns out there's a very weak dependence on the albedo. It's, okay. It's very weak. It's something like mm. albedo to minus one-eighth or some very small fraction. It's, it's very weakly sensitive compared to visible light. Right. So uh, it's not nearly as accurate in terms of getting sizes as, say, for example, a very precise shape model derived from radar observations where you're actually bouncing a radar wave off the surface of the asteroid and getting it back. But in general, if we have a good detection of an object, we can nail down its size to within about 10% or so, uh, which is much better than visible light, uh -huh. which is factors of several, usually. Cool. I want to pause briefly here for station identification. We're about halfway through the show. Uh, again, uh, this is Emily Lakdawalla for the Planetary Society, I'm blogging all the time at planetary.org slash blogs. I'm joined by Bruce Betts, our Director of Projects, and our guest Amy Meinzer from JPL, who is the Principal Investigator on the NEOWISE mission. Um, and all of you who are watching this can ask questions anytime you like by uh, either posting a comment on YouTube, by um, using Twitter and the hashtag PlanetaryLive, um, or by posting a comment on the Google Plus event, and I'll be um, feeding some of those questions to, to Amy shortly. Um, but actually, Amy, as I was uh, reintroducing you, it, it occurred to me to ask, you know, you seem to be a, a pretty young person to be a PI on a mission. I'm wondering how did you get there, and, uh, and uh, what advice would you have to offer to people who want to do what you do? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm really lucky to get to do what I do. Uh, I, I thank my lucky stars every day I come into work. I know that sounds goofy, but... You know, um, I am really, really happy to be here. It's just, it's, it's funny because it's easy to lose sight of that when you get down in the weeds, you're working on your computer and it's very frenzied and all that. But it's very nice to actually get to talk to people, uh, you know, doing the public outreach stuff, talking to other people because it kind of recenters me and makes me realize, wow, this is such an awesome job. I am so lucky. <laughs> so how did I get here? Well, I would say a lot of it was I knew at a pretty early age. I was really lucky because I knew when I was very little that I really wanted to do astronomy. And I was uh, really inspired actually by the Voyager mission, uh, I would say, uh, because uh, those, those pictures of the planets of, of Jupiter and Saturn uh, were stunning. And when I was a kid, of course, there wasn't the Internet. So, so these images were really hard to come by. And I remember I would scrounge up National Geographic's, any doctor's office I could find them in, and, you know, 
Uh, all the old library books, I had those, but of course they were mostly from the 50s, so that wasn't much help. And, you know, it, it was really, uh, I, I really wanted to know so much about planets and space and anything I could find, uh, I, could, I would try to get my hands on. And so that was sort of the guiding light, I would say, and uh, it's really been great to be able to follow it to here. Uh, and we'll see where it goes next. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually there's um, there has been one question. I'm not sure if I can find who asked it. Um, but they were wondering, uh, what, what after WISE? Is there going to be a follow-up mission to WISE? Is there some other spacecraft or some other even Earth-based thing that is going to be able to to keep on the, the survey? Or, or what, what else is going to happen next? Right. So we've got a couple things in the hopper. Right now, we're like I said, we're really busy. Uh, cranking through the WISE data because we took all these images really fast and now we have to actually figure out what do they all mean. And we've done some initial interpretations about the population of near-Earth objects. We've done some work on the Jovian Trojans, on the main belt, but there's a lot more to do. A lot more to do. That's going to keep us, our little group, very busy for, for a long time. That's How little important. is your group? Um, well, we've got, I would say, gosh, probably there's about seven or eight people. Uh, we've got some, some wonderful folks. I mean, and that's just on our little core team. There's a lot of people who are out there now who are using the WISE data. And that's actually been really wonderful. I just saw an email that said there are now hundreds of publications that have used uh, used WISE. And so that makes me very happy because it makes me feel like I've been part of something that was good. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're busy right now. And we've got students and postdocs. And it's been really lively. I like it. I think um, this week WISE was in the news, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think this was your team, right? It was a different team mining the WISE data set who found the third closest stellar system ever discovered. Yeah, that's right. That's my colleague, Kevin Lumen, and, and this is exactly what, what doing these big surveys is all about. And from a, a project science point of view, this is exactly what we want. We can start using the data, you know, we have our own little projects that we're interested in. We want to make sure the data are of good quality. But then we turn it loose to the community. I mean, it's, it's out there. The, the WISE data are, have been released to the wild. And it's really exciting to see what, what everybody else is coming up with. And they're coming up with wonderful things. I mean, I think that's sort of the best thing about providing a new tool to the, to the community is it's so much excitement to see what other people figure out with the data. And this is one of the really cool results that, that came out of it. I was really happy to see this because, uh, because it means it worked. And how cool is this? We now know the third closest star to our sun. Wow. So <laughs> It is pretty really awesome. Cool. Although, I remember the WISE mission, you guys promised me brown dwarfs that were closer to us than Alpha Centauri was. And we haven't seen those yet. Where are my brown dwarfs? I know. This is, big. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough problem. So, so this is, there's a couple things here. So the WISE team did go out and we did a big survey. And we kind of looked at the first thing we saw, which is, okay, let's see the brightest brown dwarfs, the ones that are easiest for WISE to pick out. We did find a couple of really neat things. We found one brown dwarf that's about room temperature. So that's the coldest known brown dwarf that's out there now. It's really truly halfway between a star and Jupiter itself, um, which is about 150 Kelvin. So, so that was one thing that was found fairly, fairly quickly. Um, the next thing was that uh, in the larger census of brown dwarfs, we found that there were actually a lot fewer than we might have expected. And there's a, a kind of a range of predictions from star formation theory that we would have expected to see. And this was on the very low side. We, we really thought originally that there would be brown dwarfs in more or less equal numbers to the normal stars in our solar neighborhood. That was sort of the most likely prediction. But what we actually found is that it's really more like six to one. The brown dwarfs, for whatever reason, nature just doesn't make that many of them. So that's one thing. That was a surprise. Not completely out of the question from the predictions, but it was definitely on the low side. So that makes it much less likely now that there is something much closer to the sun. They're just, brown dwarfs seem to be rarer for whatever reason. There are just fewer of them. Nature doesn't make that many. So it's not just that they're not near us. There's, they're just not as many as we thought to begin well, with that's, anywhere. That's right. That seems to be the case. There just seem to be fewer overall. And so that decreases the probability that there would be something between us and Alpha Centauri. Now, it's still remotely possible that such an object is there, um, but if it is there, it's going to be super, super faint, even for WISE, even for an observatory as, as powerful as WISE is at seeing very cold objects. The problem is it's going to be faint, and this goes back to what I was saying about the needle and the haystack problem. This is one of the new challenges. So I mentioned in the catalog we have half a billion sources. 
any one of those that's faint enough could be this, you know, if this brown dwarf exists, could be the object. And while our team has been you know, diligently following them up, and other people are too now, it's really hard. And so what you have to do is you actually have to take two halves of the survey separated by six months apart. This is why it was so important that we finished that last that last bit of survey so that we completed one full year of coverage because now we have two passes on the entire sky and what that's going to allow us to do what we're working on now the team is working on basically comparing all the sources found in the first pass on the sky in the first six months with all the sources found in the second pass on the sky in the second six months and then you have to go and look for anything that's shifted very slightly from one epoch to the next but there's half a billion <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to explain why your survey only took six months instead of a year, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, but you guys had a very tricky way of approaching this problem of doing a survey of the entire sky from a spacecraft that was in Earth orbit, and that's that you orbited over the Terminator, which is fancy astronomer speak for the, the boundary between day and night on Earth, that's and the camera was always facing out as it was going around. Yep. And so you can you imagine a plane that's tangent to the orbit of Earth, and that's the plane that you were surveying at any one time. So you, you started out like this, you went around the sun, and you, when you finished up here six months later, you had the entire sky surveyed once. Of, of course, things asteroids don't stay still, right? So <laughs> could, could you have missed some of them that were like moving just in the, in the wrong way as, as you were going around? Absolutely, yeah, and I, it's funny because it's funny to hear you say that because I always like to think of the survey pattern as a rolling donut. It's kind of rolling around the solar system, right? And that's our that's our zone of, of visibility. We can it's like a donut rolling, and after six months, you sweep out the mm, whole sky. Donuts. So if you get, oh, my donuts are so good. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, where can we go? Sorry, Day, I think actually yes, tomorrow's donut day. Okay, good. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I come? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Donuts and asteroids. So it's true that because we are moving around the solar system and the asteroids are too, it's true that we do miss some. And in fact, for the near Earth objects, you know, we saw about 700 in total. Now, we know of about 9,700 or so as of today. And we've predicted with NEOWISE that there are about 20,500 larger than 100 meters. That doesn't say anything about the ones that are smaller than that. There's probably a million of those. So with WISE, we saw a relatively small fraction of them, but the, it's the, the quality of the sample, the uniformity of the sample, the ability to get sizes, that's what made it special for the near-Earth objects. And that's what's allowed us to extrapolate to the larger population. So um, here's a, a related uh, good question from Major1029. Um, they ask that uh, so you answer the question about how you find the asteroids, but um, they're wondering how you estimate the number that there are out there in the, to begin with. It seems like you're guessing at something that you can't possibly know. Right. So there's a couple of techniques that we use. We basically look at, in terms of extrapolating the, the small sample that we have, the 700 objects, when we extrapolate that to the larger population, we have an advantage in that we know exactly where Wise pointed every single frame, and we know from looking at the stars in each frame, we have an idea of the sensitivity of the image. We know how far away we saw. We know what should have been there because we have that, that map made from all the stars in all of these millions of images. And basically what we do is we create a synthetic NEO population. We basically make up a bunch of fake NEOs and then we run them through our survey frame by frame, minute by minute, second by second, and we see what would have been detected by the spacecraft with this synthetic population. And then basically what we see is, okay, did this match what we saw? Yes or no? If no, then we readjust the number of objects in the synthetic population. We readjust what we think their sizes are so that when we get that fake survey run through our, our model, it produces exactly what we actually saw. So in other words, we know the characteristics of the instrument very well. We know, of course, what we actually saw and now what we do is we adjust the population model to, so that it produces an answer that matches. And when you get a match, then you say, all right, well, that is what, if you put this population in, this is the sample that you get out, and it's a match with what we actually saw. So that's how we unwind from our sample what we think is actually out there in the population. That's more or less how it works. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, so Bill Campbell wants to know if Jupiter is still helping in cleaning up the main belt and reducing the population of objects in the belt. Hmm. Okay, so 
Jupiter definitely has a very powerful role in shaping where the asteroids are in our solar system and what happens to them. And woe betide any asteroid that strays too close to Jupiter <laughs> because uh, it, uh, it's going to get either kicked out or shredded or, or flung somewhere else. So I, I would say that Jupiter certainly plays a powerful role in shaping the main belt. It is not clear to me that the number of asteroids in the main belt is actually significantly changing or decreasing as of right now. In the past, that was probably true, particularly around the turbulent time when the giant planets were, were forming and kind of rearranging themselves uh, shortly after the solar system formed. Right now, what happens is if individual objects get a little too close to Jupiter, then they, they change orbits rather rapidly. And there are very strong gravitational resonances throughout the main belt. A lot of them are caused by Jupiter that if an asteroid strays into one of those resonances, it can get ejected from the belt, either into the inner solar system or out into the outer solar system. So it's still playing an active role, but I wouldn't say it's changing the overall numbers all substantially. Actually, it's, it's interesting watching the very same processes operate at, at Saturn, with Saturn and it, all of its moons and the ring system, which is kind of like a miniature version of a solar system. And, you, and yeah. Cassini has been watching all of these things evolve over a much shorter time scale, obviously, than what's happening in the asteroid belt. Um, are, you, are you keeping on top of the ring studies at, at Saturn? Do you, are you able to read outside your field? Or are you yes, I, well, I'm, actually, I'm a big ring fan, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like reading about Saturn and Cassini because, I mean, it actually is a childhood interest, I would say. You know what I mean? It's something I've been interested in since I was very young because of Voyager. Um, so I've kind of kept an eye on it. And I think it's really interesting how you can see how the same resonances and the same, the same gravitational and non-gravitational forces shape the ring system in, in just the same way, as you say, uh, with the main belt. The only difference being the particles are a lot smaller than the ring system, so the relative ratio between the two forces is probably quite a bit different. Um, but yeah, it's the same physics. It's, it's actually really remarkable to see the, the same dramas being played out on a, on a different scale in, in the Saturnian system. So I'm a, I'm a big fan. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so Kevin Weatherwalks wants to know what methods are used to confirm a new near-Earth object. Um, he says that as you find more and more of them, it seems kind of like searching for new prime numbers. You need to check to make sure it isn't already cataloged. Yes. So how do you check these new objects against the database? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important Point. I mean, one of the most difficult things when you're doing asteroid work is you have to make sure that it's not another asteroid. And especially when you have a, a large volume of data coming in very quickly, you've got to sort out which is the, the wheat and which is the chaff, and which things do you want to spend your effort uh, trying to do follow-up work on. Now, for WISE, WISE by itself was actually not capable, in, in most cases, of doing independent asteroid discovery. Uh, the, the amount of time, because of the orbit, or this rolling donut, Right. So even if you account for the fact that we're mostly moving in the same direction as the asteroids, we typically only saw an object for about a day to a day and a half. And that by itself is not long enough to really figure out what its orbit is like. It gives you a preliminary idea, but it doesn't allow you to predict where it's going to be, say, in three to five years. And the reason so for that is is because you have you might have like three or five observations, and that's a little tiny line segment that you could fit with an orbit of virtually any size or shape. Exactly. So it's enough to give you an idea, is it a near-Earth object, is it not a near-Earth object? Uh, but that's where confusion with other objects can come into play. You, know, you, have to, you have to be very careful not to mix in the detections of another asteroid in there with your new object. So that's one complication. Uh, but the other thing is you, you want to be sure, okay, is this, is this worth following up with a ground-based telescope? So one of the unique challenges with the WISE survey is that it really was a, a year-long observing campaign. Uh, every day, uh, rain or shine, and spacecraft don't care whether or not the moon is up or you know, whether it's raining on the ground or whether there's cloud cover or whether it sends you an object at a declination of you know, plus 75 or something crazy. Uh, so one of the real challenges was trying to secure follow-up on, on each of the near-Earth object candidates that we detected. And we were able to do that in most cases, uh, thanks to a lot of wonderful help from, from amateurs and professionals uh, alike, which was fabulous. We really, uh, we really appreciate that, because that's how we were able to do the near object survey. And this is so, something that I like to write about a lot on the blog. It's, it's amazing how important the participation of amateur astronomers is in the furthering yes. of modern astronomy. It's, it's not just a hobby. They really are making contributions to science. It's kind of like back in the 18th century when you had these you know, uh, people who had a lot of free time on their hands, a lot of money, and they were the ones doing all the science. 
it's yeah. it's we're kind of back to that again. These these people they have amazing instruments and they spend tons of time just looking at the sky and and helping you guys do your work. Well, it was actually really inspiring, and I I'm pretty sure there's a planetary science grant, if I'm not mistaken, that goes for amateurs who do asteroid follow up work. Um, yeah, we've that we've, was that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes, it's the uh, Shoemaker Neo grants, and we're actually will. Uh, announce some new winners in the next couple months. But oh, we've excellent. Had, a, had a lot of success with these these amateur groups all around the world with their amazing telescope setups and their focus. Particularly, I mean, the focus of the program is enhancing uh, the telescope operations so they can do follow up. Whether it was NeoWise or now follow up from the professional ground based surveys, because whether it's uh, spacecraft or the ground-based surveys, typically they don't have a lot of their time to go back, even though they're not in a rolling donut, they don't have time to go back and <laughs> get the data points to make that arc so you know where what the orbit is and whether it's going to hit Earth, and that's where these right. crazed astronomers come in, amateur astronomers come in with uh, filling in filling in the holes. So we're happy and pleased that we contribute to that, and they they get some they get some discoveries and they do some physical characterization but still the the main hole they fill is this uh, lots and lots of follow up observations to get orbits That's how right. big of a telescope do these people have to be able to use to help you out it really depended some of the objects were were quite bright uh, one of the challenges is that many of them though because we were seeing a lot of the darker low albedo objects things that have low reflectivity uh, a lot of them were really faint, and, and that was one of the very difficult challenges. So uh, people really pitched in, and you know, the way I think of our amateur people, it's not really fair to call them amateurs, right. uh, but professional quality, uh, it's just not their day job. You know? That's the original meaning of amateur, they do it entirely for the love of it. That's it, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, it's links in a chain, basically, is the way I see it. I mean, you know, you, you have to have this whole chain in order to discover the objects, characterize them, figure out the orbit, mm -hmm. and then see what does it mean in the big picture for the population and for the hazard specifically. So it really takes all of these people from, from the surveys all the way through the follow-up, all the way through uh, the, the science and the interpretation of the result. You, you, you can't have one without the other. So it, it really is essential. And um, thank you to Planetary Society for funding some of our great follow-up. <laughs> Really helped. Awesome. <laughs> and, Good. You know, Excellent. When you're chasing asteroids, you really want every one followed up, especially when you discover them with an infrared telescope, because each one is is very precious. Uh, it, it has a lot of science value. So, no, and that's anyway, the is. I was just going to say that's an impressive uh, program you had to coordinate, because as you say, if, if you don't get them quickly, then you are very likely to lose them since you don't know what their orbit is from a, just a brief number of observations. So how many, um, how many NEO discoveries did NEOWISE end up with with this right. process? So in the one year, we ended up with about 135. And I would say right. we, we lost from the records of the Minor Planet Center maybe 20 candidates or so. So we did mm. pretty darn well. Yeah, that's okay. great. And the losses were, were minimal, uh, mostly to weather, or if something was just so right. faint that you know they, the the available telescope couldn't get it because it was too faint. Uh, we especially had holes in the southern hemisphere that we tend not to have a lot of uh, follow-up resources there. Right. So. So we still have a lot of uh, good questions to get to. I want to remind viewers that you can still ask more questions. This will be my last call for questions, so go ahead and get them in there, and I'll try to um, get as many of them to Amy as I can. Um, the next question is, comes from Sylvan Westby. Um, he says that Wise has, he was kind of surprised by how small the, the optics were on Wise, and he wants to know if you were to fly another IR survey space mission, would you go for higher, sensitiv higher sensitivity, or would it be better to have more frequent data points? What would be the way you would want to upgrade Wise? Right. So, yeah, as I like to say, Wise was uh, small but mighty, you know. <laughs> it's, 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 because uh, being in space, being able to get the telescope cold, it's, uh, it, as my colleague, the principal investigator of the WISE mission, Ned Wright, likes to say, it's, you know, this 40 centimeter telescope, by virtue of being cold and in space, is worth thousands of 8 meter telescopes at this wavelength on the ground. So it really comes down to being able to get the telescope cold and the detectors cold. Uh, we have thought a lot about advanced surveys, and NASA is also thinking a lot about it. Um, there are some things you'd like to do that, uh, you know, we would basically spiff up wise a little bit, but it's not terribly, terribly different, actually. Uh, just some very simple modifications could be made. But 
you know, we're working on it, and there's uh, there's a lot of good options out there. Um, thank you. Kevin Hyder wants to know, he says, I take it WISE was pointing the wrong direction to, de to detect any Atira near-Earth asteroids, uh, asteroids that are pretty close to the sun. Right, yeah, exactly. So we always point perpendicular with our rolling donut. We are, you know, the donut, the plane of the donut is always perpendicular to the line between the Earth and the sun. So because of that, we could never really look inward with the telescope. Uh, we would have been blinded by sunlight and the temperature would have gone up. So, no, we were not able to see asteroids whose orbits are entirely contained within the Earth's orbit. And those are very rare, but obviously because it's very hard to observe them, uh, that's probably why we don't see so many, but we don't know uh, very well how many are there. So that's why with the NEOWISE survey, we, we weren't able to see them. We can't comment on how many are likely to be there because we have a sample of zero. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens next, maybe another telescope. I know there are a lot of asteroid scientists that would really love to put a spacecraft in orbit at Venus's orbit from the Sun, because then you'd be able to catch a lot of these things that are hard to catch from Earth. Well, um, there's a lot of different approaches to this, and there are different ways to do it. I mean, one thing you could do is you could stay close to Earth, but not too close, and just be able to point a little closer. WISE had a very special, special design uh, set of restraints. It wasn't necessary to point particularly close to the sun in order to do that all-sky survey, which was really driven by the astrophysics science, you know, in other words, uh, the need to find the brown dwarfs, looking for ultra-luminous galaxies that show up very brightly in infrared. That doesn't require pointing particularly close to the sun, so we didn't do it. But yeah. another telescope could be designed that would be different. I do tend to forget that WISE had other functions than detecting asteroids. <laughs> it was actually a relatively minor one, right, in terms yeah. of its uh, design and, and uh, mission success goals, right? Yeah, it was originally, uh, the, the primary science goals for WISE originally, well, with sort of the zeroth level requirement, if you will, starting at zero, um, was to just carry out the all-sky survey. That was the most important thing, because that, that survey, that is the basic tool. You know, the way I like to think of it in astronomy is you kind of have two basic tools. You have your surveys and then you have your follow-up instruments that give you really detailed information about these things that you find in the survey. So you, you know, you're using the survey to find the most interesting places to go, interesting places to look, and then you use your follow-up equipment, whether it's a, a rendezvous mission, a flyby, or another larger telescope, that's how you follow up. So with WISE, the first goal was to really just generate the survey. But the, the two first-level primary science goals, I would say, uh, were to find the brown dwarfs and also to look for these ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. And the asteroids, it was recognized for a long time that it would be able to do some very good work with asteroids. Uh, but what was, we were very lucky to get the support from, uh, from NASA to, to do is basically build the software that lets us go in and, and dig out the asteroids uh, frame by frame. Uh, because originally the plan was actually to take all of the images that we have, and we have on average sort of about 8 to 10 images of each location on the sky. The original plan was to take those and just average them together to make the best possible single frame image of each part of the sky. And that's great if what you're looking for doesn't move. Uh, but if it moves, it has the very bad effect of just averaging it out. So uh, what we were able to do with the NeoWise project is basically go in, keep all of the individual frames, and then go look for things that move in each frame. So we were very lucky that we were able to do that. Yeah, it seems like a small thing how you how you build your software, but it's, it's something that actually I encounter all the time because I, I like to dig into the Hubble archives and find really pretty Hubble pictures. And of course, all of their uh, database tools are really designed for things that aren't moving. They want you to specify position on the sky. Fortunately, they have anticipated this problem. There are ways to query the database for things that move. Um, but it's, it's definitely not part of their original uh, 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 the way they think about using the instrument in the first place. Yeah, that's right. The needs of planetary scientists are, are, are definitely different, I would say, than in, in, in some regards than you know, traditional non-solar system astronomy. I mean, that, that has really been... And, and it's funny because the, the nearby brown dwarf problem sort of straddles this boundary a little bit because you're looking for things that move, but really slowly <laughs> and not on time scales of the asteroid. So that's why our asteroid hunting software move on time scales of, of hours, you know, minutes even. And that's just not what these brown dwarfs do. They move much slower. So we have to build other software to look for things that move on that time scale. It's tough. 
All right, so I have a couple more questions here. CJ Dugan wants to know if WISE can infer the composition of the asteroids that you're surveying, or is it just size and distance? Right, so we can actually learn quite a bit about the, the composition, and we've been working on that pretty hard right now. Um, one thing you can tell is if you have the infrared light and you have visible light for a particular object, you can immediately learn its reflectivity. And that's a clue as to the composition. If something shows up and it's, it's particularly highly reflective, it reflects a lot of sunlight, then it indicates it's more likely to have a, a stony composition or rocky composition or pro perhaps even metallic, as opposed to these more primitive objects that are, are dark, like a piece of coal. Those are much more likely to be perhaps a dormant comet, a comet that's kind of you know, run out of gas and had all of its uh, ices vaporized off the surface. So that gives you a kind of clue as to the composition, that reflectivity, but then you want to also do more sophisticated modeling techniques to see if you can learn more about the physical properties on that surface and in the interior. So we have a project going on right now that's actually taking uh, radar images of some of the asteroids where we have WISE data and combining it to basically look at the detailed thermal properties of the surface. What is the nature of the stuff that's on there? Is it rocks or is it sand? Is it, is it fine powder? Or is it just bare? Is it nothing? This is plain rocky surface, plain flat surface. So that's what we're trying to learn now. That'll give us some clue as to composition for selected targets. It's a tough problem. OK, uh, Buffy Bloggs wants to know about amateurs. Uh, she says, it seems like most of them are doing observation. Are there opportunities for amateurs to actually participate in the analysis and maybe even get their, their names on papers? Sure. I mean, well, one person in particular, there's a couple of folks who have done excellent follow-up work. I mean, one of the most important things I would say that, uh, that amateur, amateur uh, asteroid observers can do is, is look for uh, light curves. Basically, this is basically, instead of just doing kind of selected targeted observations to pin down the orbit, which we obviously need, we also need information on the detailed shapes of the objects. Because that's, again, like if we have a shape and we can combine it with infrared data, for example, now we can start to infer properties of the surface material, the thermal conductivity, the porosity, things like that. Um, so to do that, one of the ways to do it, if you can't get radar imagery, is to basically take very detailed light curve observations of it. So this is basically now where you sit and you, you watch the object rotating as, it, as, you, as you track it. And from that rotation, you can actually, if you get enough observations of it, you can actually back out the shape of the asteroid and its rotation state, and that's really valuable information if you want to learn the composition. So amateurs have been really doing a great job, some of them on doing light curves. Uh, some of them take color filter observations of the object, which also gives you a clue about the composition. That's incredibly valuable. So there, there are a lot of things I think that astronomers who are amateurs can, can do uh, to contribute to the cause. All right, well, I have one final question that's uh, from not a, um, a member of the public, but rather one of your colleagues, Andy Rivkin, wants to know, what's your favorite asteroid? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you know I love them all. I can't shoot. <laughs> All right. That's and, terrible, Sophie's choice. No, <laughs> I love them all. Andy is the is the Shakespearean fool of the uh, of the <laughs> asteroid community. He's smarter than everybody, but he pretends he's not. Um, all right. So, Amy, I want to thank you so much for spending the time with us today. This has been great. You've answered a lot of questions, and um, it's been really fun. I hope that we can have a chance to do this again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really had a great time. And uh, to everybody who's watching, we do this every week on Thursdays at noon Pacific time. Now that it's been daylight saving time, it's 1900 UTC. Um, I hope to see you next week. I should, I never remember to check who's going to be on next week, but I'm sure it'll be awesome. So please do tune in next week. Um, and thank you all for spending the time with us. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Amy. And bye-bye uh, to everybody. Bye.